k and is a company that's been selling air filters since 1969 to consumers. We invented the high-flow cotton air filter that's washable and reusable and can actually last for the life of a vehicle. And there's nothing that this company feels is more important than the quality of the products that we sell or the satisfaction of our consumers after they purchase those products and put them in vehicles, which in most cases are going to be in those vehicles for as long as our customers own them. But truly, each individual consumer experience with a K&N product is what has gotten this company to be perceived by many to be the world's best air filter company. I think what you're about to see you'll find interesting because not only do we get deeply into the issue of mass airflow sensors and how they operate within a vehicle environment, but we learned a lot more about the actual physical processes of air moving through the filter and into an engine than even we had understood before. And we, to greater or lesser extent, have been studying this for over 35 years. Early on, we recognized that the consumer was in the middle in, in an incident like this with his uh, mass airflow sensor and his new car warranty. We also understand that the dealership is many times in the middle also between uh, a consumer and a district representative. So both parties are in the middle. Our goal is to give both of them information that they can use to solve the problem. We just refuse to allow our customer to be in the middle of a situation like this. We stand behind our product. Once we recover uh, the sensor and all the components, what we do is we issue it a number so that we can track it from beginning to end through our system. We'll put the uh, components into the lab, and what we initially do to start out with is for the mass air sensor, we'll take that mass air sensor and we'll look at it under a microscope and actually see that a 5,000 times magnification, what, what is going on with it. It wasn't contaminated at all. Um, if it's a dry contamination, we just continue on with running it on the test stand. If uh, there's any dampness, if, if, any, if there is a contamination on it and if it has any dampness property whatsoever to it, what we will do is we have a, uh, a, an agreement set up with a forensics laboratory nearby and we will send it to them and they'll do a complete chemical and elemental analysis on it. They've already done a complete analysis on our filter oil so they know what to look for and, and what to compare it against. And we receive that back from the lab with a determination, is it just oil, common minerals, whatever, whatever is on the, the master sensor, we get, we get their, uh, their diagnosis back from them. Then we will run it on the test stand and see how it runs. You know, does it, how does it compare to a new one? The test stand features a variable airflow source along with a constant mass air meter that is calibrated annually. This gives us repeatability and with the computer generated data acquisition system gives us very smooth, consistent, and repeatable data. In our testing we use two different style mass air sensors. The hot wire sensor and the hot film sensor. These are the two commonly used sensors in the automotive industry and they work according to the same principle. When the engine is running and air flows through the intake and through the mass air sensor, the air that flows by actually cools down the element. So the ECU has to add extra voltage to maintain a certain temperature. And that voltage difference is used to determine the airflow in the engine. To provide you with an overall summary of the results of our testing, uh, I'm going to share with you some specific information and refer you to some charts. Uh, as of February 2007, we've physically recovered and subjected to testing 107 individual mass airflow sensors of different types and varieties depending upon the circumstances or the vehicles that they came out of. Now out of the 107 sensors that we physically uh, looked at in this way over the last two and a half years I guess it's been, there were 65 of the sensors that were actually functioning perfectly fine. 
So in other words, 65 over 50% of the 107 sensors that we recovered were never malfunctioning in the first place. Out of the 42 sensors that we found to be malfunctioning, 19 of them were the result of a complete electronic failure which means that when we would apply an electrical voltage to one end of the sensor, regardless of the condition of the sensor, it should still be able to pass some level of current to the other end of the sensor if the material is simply conducting uh, electricity. And in 19 of these cases, there was no conduction happening at all, so it was in essence a material failure in that it would no longer conduct any voltage at all uh, through the sensor. In the remaining 23 of the cases, what we found when we put the sensors on the test bench was that the measurements of the levels of current that were passing through the sensor when subjected to different amounts of airflow would be out of tolerance or out of range, as we would say. So in other words, when compared to a brand new, perfectly functioning sensor, we could detect that the 23 sensors we're talking about now were not passing or were not fluctuating their signal in a manner similar to a new sensor. Again, to summarize, out of the 23 sensors that we tested as malfunctioning out of a total population of 107, 14 of those sensors were contaminated with silicone. Five of those sensors had some level of dirt visible on them at high magnification, and four of the sensors were perfectly clean. None of the sensors that failed on the test bench or that showed any deviation from the amount of electrical current they should be passing when compared to a new sensor, none of them had any K&N filter oil on them when subjected to a chemical analysis. We've discovered that oil will not come off of a K&N air filter under any normal operating conditions inside of a vehicle. Our goal in this, in performing this extensive investigation into the mass air sensors, is to determine not who is at fault, but just what happened in, in the incident. Um, we will use this information to assist the dealer to better understand uh, and also to aid the customer in this warranty issue. On behalf of K&N, I guess I can say that the best thing about this entire process we've been through is the extent to which it's reconnected us with real consumer experiences with our product um, in the world as they take their cars into dealerships. And it's helped us understand how important it is for a manufacturer to not just stand behind its products, but to stand behind its consumers. And so in addition to the fact that we sell replacement air filters that are backed by the world's first million mile warranty, we now actually offer something that we call our Consumer Protection Pledge, which means that we pledge that consumers that buy and use K&N products will never be allowed to be in a position where they're in the middle between a service provider or a dealership who believes our product has caused a problem and K&N. We have a dealer relations department now who will step right into that situation, interact directly with the dealership or service provider, and resolve that consumer's problem one way or another. We're very proud of this pledge because we think recognizing our obligation to consumers is even one step ahead of backing our product with a million mile warranty. After receiving back many of these mass air sensors, I think we were right around mid-90s, almost 100 mass air sensors that had been sent back to us for analysis, and we were finding no K&N oil on any of them, we started wondering, well, maybe, you know, what, what is the circumstance that, that oil might come off our filter and contaminate a mass air sensor? We've not seen one yet. So we decided to do some extreme testing, some real-world testing, and see what, what condition does it take to move oil off of our filter to potentially contaminate a mass air sensor. So we decided to look at this whole program. So we set up a test protocol. One of them was we took a brand new 2007 Chevy Silverado truck, we cut a window in the air box, and we put a wind meter inside of it. 
and we wanted to see what is the airflow inside the airbox at varying speeds on this vehicle. And we used our own in-house dyno which to perform this test and we captured it on video. What we did is we put the wind meter on the, the, we did some testing to find the sweet spot on the filter where most air was moving through it where we would get the highest speed. And we decided to measure that under varying driving conditions. But what we found out is under normal acceleration, that vehicle, typical driving like accelerating up an on-ramp, let's say going up on the freeway, getting up to 70 miles an hour, the air moving through the filter was only four miles an hour maximum. Once we got the vehicle up to speed, we were dealing now with only one mile per hour. That is the air moving through the filter. That's the air speed that would have to move the oil off the filter. Four miles an hour, that's walking speed down the hallway. So we took it to an even further extreme and we held it in second gear and we ran the same vehicle all the way to red line, holding it in second gear and we reached a maximum of 12. But if you run the math on it, what you find out is that 10 to 12 miles an hour going through that filter, which is 100 square inches, uh, does translate out to about 90 miles an hour at the throttle body. But you've got to back up. You, you, you know, the, the oil has to come off of the filter, and that's, and that's where the 100 square inches are that has about one ounce of K&N oil on it. We used an additional piece of equipment here at, at K&N in our laboratory, which is an air filtration stand in which an absolute filter is used. If anything gets through the test filter, it gets trapped by the absolute filter. So you weigh it, you have an exact weight in the beginning. So if anything moves through our filter that's put in place, it gets trapped by the absolute and it's going to show up in the weight. So what we did is we took one of our filters and we intentionally overoiled it by approximately 30%. We put it in that test stand and we ran it at 1,000 CFM for three days straight. And at the end of the three days, there was no detectable weight gain at all by the absolute. And we weighed the filter also to see if any weight had, had left the filter and maybe was trapped in the air ducting or something. Uh, and it had lost no weight at all. So no oil came off of that filter after three days of being subjected to 1,000 CFM. <laughs> The first test that we did was submerging the sensor in oil and complete a worst case scenario and just see what happened to the sensor. And what we saw was really interesting because we saw that the airflow and therefore the engine um, would actually draw the oil off the sensor and the voltage output readings were a little awkward in the beginning but after a couple of cycles and when the oil was drawn off the sensor the sensor returned back to normal and would perform just as it did before it was submerged in oil. We heard rumors on the internet that oil would actually be drawn off our filters and cause the mass air sensor to fail. So we wanted to duplicate that situation and we grabbed an airbrush and hooked it up to the mass air sensor test stand and applied a constant oil feed to the sensor. And the results were interesting because we were not able to harm the sensor in any way. The third test that we performed, we added dirt to the mass air sensor. We actually grabbed ISO test dust and added this to the sensor while running the test stand. In the meantime, we were monitoring the voltage output and we saw that it didn't harm the sensor at all and we had no differences in the voltage output readings. We found out that mass air sensors are very durable and we were not able to cause one to fail. A significant percentage of the mass air sensors that were sent back to us had a silicone contamination present on them. That didn't necessarily mean that the mass air sensor was defective because many of those still operated properly even though they had a silicone contamination. Now the silicone comes directly from the mass air sensor itself. To understand where silicone would come from, we had to go back and understand how mass airflow sensors were actually manufactured 
and learned that there's quite a bit of silicone in a mass airflow sensor and an opportunity for it to creep down onto the actual sensor wire. Due to the mass air sensor living in such a difficult environment with vibration and heat, when they assemble the mass air sensor, the area at the very top of it where the circuitry is, is filled with a silicone compound to isolate it or insulate it from vibration and heat. It is then sealed up at the end as the final process. The thermistors connect directly to the bottom of the circuit board that is basically sealed in this silicone material. What happens on some of these as they break down, the silicone will creep underneath the circuit board and work its way down the heated wires that the thermistor is uh, attached to. There are three separate factory and technical service bulletins that are out there right now that address the issue of mass air sensors being contaminated by crankcase vapors. Uh, through the PCV uh, system, the evaporative canister system also bleeds into the, uh, feeds into the air intake. All of those gases are percolating around there, especially when the vehicle is shut down and air is no longer moving through there. You have all of those vapors that are mixing around inside the system. That's the other reason that, that's one of the reasons anyway, that a mass air sensor has a burn-off cycle. Many of them have a burn-off cycle onto it to remove the, uh, the particulates that may attach themselves to the thermistors or the hot film during that process. Another thing that, that confirms that gases do exist inside of the air intake is the newer vehicles in the tighter and tighter compliances with EPA are putting a carbon trap because as the gases move through the intake, they try to escape into the atmosphere. So more and more manufacturers are putting carbon traps in the air box itself to trap the gases there. Well, once they get to the air box, they've already moved past the mass air sensor. It's just the environment that they live in. It's not a clean, pristine environment.